If you're a big Apple fan like I am, then you've probably spent a good amount of time browsing their website, which is perhaps one of the best designed and well-optimized sites in the industry. But what you may not realize is that Apple's website also serves as a historical timeline of the company, since how the website looks and works is defined by the design trends of the period. So in this video, we're going to explore the history of Apple through the lens of their website. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you want to help decide which topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and voting polls like this one will show up in your mobile activity feed. Now, I want to start off the video by breaking down the six eras we'll be exploring. Before Steve Jobs, Platinum, Aqua, Aluminum, Glass, and finally, Flat. So let's start off with the first era of Apple's website, before Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs was Apple's co-founder and eventual CEO, so what do I mean by before Steve Jobs? Well, there was a period from 1985 to 1996 when Jobs wasn't with the company. He had been forced out of his leadership position at Apple by its board of directors after the unimpressive launch of the original Macintosh in 1984, a project which Jobs had led. And it was during that period when the internet became popular and Apple had to make a website. So in 1994, Apple.com made its debut, and here's what it looked like. Now, it certainly wasn't the pinnacle of graphic design, but it did represent where Apple was at that time. They had no clear direction, and the company's leadership was changing hands frequently. The role of CEO went from John Scully to Michael Spindler to Gil Emilio in a period of five years. And Apple's website during that time reflected the company's lack of vision. Here's what it looked like in 1994. Then in 1996, it changed to this skeuomorphic design. And then in 1997, we have this text-heavy approach. But it wasn't only Apple's website that suffered during this era, it was also their products. With Jobs gone, the company began a race to the bottom, foregoing the philosophy of building a small number of premium high-priced computers in favor of a new business strategy, trying to make as many cheap computers as possible in order to stimulate sales and grow revenue. Apple's product line grew so large and fragmented that they actually had to send flowcharts to their salespeople explaining which model out of dozens would be suitable for which customer. And as you can imagine, this business approach failed miserably and helped push Apple to the brink of bankruptcy. It was then when, to his credit, Gil Emilio decided to buy Next, a computer company Jobs had founded while away from Apple. It was a good decision not only because it brought Steve Jobs back to Apple, but it provided the company with the foundations of a modern operating system that they'd been trying and failing to develop for years. Now, with Jobs back at Apple, the company was reinvigorated with the same product philosophy that led them to success in the early days. Focus your best resources on a few great products. And their website during this period reflected that mantra. It went from this in 1997 to this in 1998. The homepage changed from being wordy and busy to being simple and visually appealing. And again, Apple's products reflected this change as well. The iMac G3 was the most bold computer the company had ever made, and it marked a new era of Apple that restored their reputation of being a premium computer company with a focus on great design. The iMac went on to become the best-selling product in Apple's history at the time and helped save the company from financial ruin. This is the second time period that I call Platinum, since Apple's website resembled the Platinum user interface of Mac OS 9. And while we're on the subject of websites, I want to share some information about mine. If you guys haven't noticed, I do have a website that directs visitors to my channel and social media accounts, and although it isn't full of content, it does have a very important purpose. It allowed me to buy the appleexplain.com domain before anyone else, and therefore claim a custom email address, info at appleexplain.com, and I was able to claim my domain name, build my website, and create a custom email address, all with the same service and that's Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace for over a year now after switching between other services, and I'm really happy with what they have to offer. Squarespace had the most website templates to choose from, and they're all optimized for mobile, so I didn't have to do any extra work for that. 
And when I wanted to sell a merch product, I was able to add an e-commerce store to my site without starting from scratch. Plus, the payment processor was built in, and I could print shipping labels straight from Squarespace as well. When I say it's an all-in-one platform, I really mean it. And you can get all this for cheaper than you might think, especially if you use the link squarespace.com slash apple explained, since you'll get 10% off your first purchase. You can find that link in the description. Now, back to the iMac G3, which was just the beginning for Apple, since Jobs had a plan to release three more products, a Pro Desktop, a Pro Notebook, and a Consumer Notebook. By 1999, that goal had been achieved with the Power Mac G4, PowerBook, and iBook, all of which featured a glossy design that Apple eventually carried through to its new operating system, Mac OS X. In 2000, Apple debuted this new user interface called Aqua and applied it to their website the same year. This began what I call the Aqua era, and it had a big influence on how the website looked and worked, introducing a new tabbed toolbar with a pinstriped background. Now, Apple stuck with this design language for about seven years until the aluminum era, and that's when many of their products began transitioning from glossy plastic to matte aluminum, and Apple's website did the same. Just look at how much aluminum Apple began using in their products during this time. I actually remember a childhood friend of mine saying, I can't believe Apple made an aluminum iPod classic. That's just wrong. And many others echoed this sediment, since this transition to aluminum was the first major design language change Apple had experienced since the glossy plastic days of the original iPod and iMac. And as you can see, the website toolbar changed from a glossy aqua tabbed design to a simpler gray layout that reflected the new designs of their products. But something interesting happened next that I still can't fully explain. In 2011, Apple decided to modify the toolbar to a glossy glass texture rather than the matte finish. And while I'm not sure what prompted this change, I do have some theories. It could be that glass touchscreens were becoming the focus of Apple's product line with the addition of devices like the iPad and touchscreen iPod Nano, but I think the more likely reason is that Apple's web designers were taking cues from the iOS interface, which featured glossy icons, a glossy dock, and glossy menu buttons. After all, iOS was exploding in popularity during this time, and I think Apple was capitalizing on this trend. Now, the final era of Apple's website, and the one we're currently in, is what I simply call flat. It debuted in 2014, soon after iOS 7 was released, and it took its design cues from that operating system, which famously marked Apple's transition from a skeuomorphic UI to a flat UI, which removed all the glossiness, reflections, and shadows that had defined the appearance of the iPhone's operating system since its introduction in 2007. And as you can imagine, it was a very controversial move that many users disagreed with. But Apple pressed on and doubled down by updating its website to the design we're familiar with today. The toolbar became less of a bar and more of a rectangle that stretched from one end of the browser window to the other. This actually marked the first time Apple had a website that was truly responsive to window resizing and had an optimized appearance on mobile. The photos featured on the homepage were full width, and the store interface was reorganized and simplified to feature product icons and banners, rather than trying to fit every product onto a single page. But as I mentioned earlier in the video, Apple's website is still indicative of the company as a whole, and I think it's important to reflect on where Apple is at today. Just like their website is more simplified and focused than ever before, I think the same can be said for Apple's product line. They discontinued products like the iPod Shuffle, Nano, and Classic, and even exited the internet router market by ending production of their Airport Express and Airport Extreme, all in an effort to focus their resources on products that have the biggest effect on their customers and business. They've also been very deliberate when entering new product categories. Many people have been begging Apple to make a game console for years, but they've refused, understanding that such a product wouldn't be conductive to their business goals. On the other hand, every new product category that Apple has entered in the last five years has been largely successful, including the Apple Watch, AirPods, and HomePod. This hasn't always been the case, since there were products under Steve Jobs that failed to go anywhere at all, like the iPod Hi-Fi. 
So with Apple's website in the best shape it's ever been, I think the same can be said for the company itself, and I look forward to the new changes they have in store for us in the near future. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.